Now, the part of the chapter that I want to focus on is beginning there in verse 22, where the Bible reads, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, this week, Pope Francis is visiting the United States, and I think that Pope Francis is the greatest false prophet on the earth at this time. As far as the most people listen to him, look to him, he has over a billion people following him, worshiping him, literally. And so the title of the sermon this morning is Pope Francis and His Lies. So I'm going to start out here with a quote from St. not St. Francis, good night, Pope Francis, because I've got a list of quotes from him, and I just want to show you how this man is a false prophet, and what he teaches is directly contrary to the Bible. And you say, well, I'm offended by the sermon. Well, here's the thing, though. The Word of God is the final authority. Amen. Okay, so if, if he is preaching lies in the face of the Word of God, which is the truth, then the truth needs to be preached and he needs to be pointed out as the false prophet and liar that he is. Amen. Now, first of all, here's a quote from Pope Francis. He said this, The Lord has redeemed all of us, all of us with the blood of Christ. All of us, not just Catholics, everyone. But Father, the atheists, even the atheists, everyone. So according to Pope Francis, everyone is redeemed by the blood of Christ, even an atheist. You don't even have to believe in God. You don't even have to believe in Jesus, according to Pope Francis, in order to be redeemed. Now, first of all, the fact that he's even calling himself Father right there is blasphemy in and of itself. Yeah. Even the name the Pope is blasphemy. The Pope is just another language for the Father. And the Bible says, call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your Father which is in heaven. The Bible says in Matthew 23 that we are not to be called Father, master, or rabbi. These are terms that are off limits for a religious leader. We should be called pastor, teacher, bishop, elder, but never father, never rabbi, never master. Those names are over the top. But look down at the Bible and let's see if, if Saint, or good night, why do I keep calling him that? Let's see if, you know why? I'll tell you why. There's this really good restaurant called St. Francis and I eat there all, I love it. So <laughs> maybe I'm just hungry. But anyway, but anyway, look what the Bible says in Romans 3.22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, according to Pope Francis, this redemption is for everybody, even people who don't even believe, even atheists. They're redeemed by the blood of Christ, but keep reading. It says at the end of verse 24, the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. You see, he's only the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. The redemption is through faith in his blood. It's not just a redemption where it doesn't matter what you believe, everybody's going to go to heaven. No, the Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The name of Jesus he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But Pope Francis just gets up and says, hey, we're all redeemed. We're all saved. Even atheists are saved. Here's another quote along the same lines from Pope Francis. Since many of you do not belong to the Catholic Church and others are non-believers, so he's talking about people who don't believe whatsoever. Non-believers, from the bottom of my heart, I give this silent blessing to each and every one of you, respecting the conscience of each one of you, but knowing that each one of you is a child of God. He's basically just saying everybody's a child of God. Listen to this quote. The Son of God became incarnate in the souls of men to instill the feeling of brotherhood. I thought that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world, but apparently 
uh, he was sent just to instill the feeling of brotherhood. <laughs> he said, all are brothers and all are children of God. That is not what the Bible teaches. Now, if you would, flip over to John chapter 1. Just a few pages to the left in your Bible. John chapter 1. And let's see what the Bible says in light of this. So Francis's message is, hey, everybody's saved. Everybody's redeemed. We're all children of God. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. But what does the Bible say? Well, in Galatians 3.26, it says, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. See, what makes us a child of God is our faith in Jesus. Amen. And then the Bible says, in John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Look, you become a son of God, meaning you weren't one before. But when you believe on the name of Jesus, you become a son of God. It's only those who are saved who are children of God, according to the Bible. It's not that we're all just children of God. That's not true. Now, also, the thing that keeps coming up in these scriptures that we're looking at is the fact that salvation is by believing. This is another thing that the Roman Catholic Church does not teach. This is another thing that the Pope will not stand for because they teach that you have to do works in order to be saved. You have to believe, but also you have to do works. And then Francis, he just eliminates the believe part altogether. And says, well, just do works and you'll be fine. Just do good. Listen to this along the same lines. He said, proselytism is solemn nonsense. It makes no sense. We need to get to know each other listen to each other, and improve our knowledge of the world around us. Now, just to explain to you what the word proselyte means, it's a word that's used four times in the Bible. And the word proselyte simply means a person who converts from one religion to another. That's called a proselyte, when you switch religions. So he's saying proselytism is nonsense. He's saying trying to get people to convert to Christianity is nonsense according to Francis, because remember, we're all redeemed. He says, instead, instead of going out trying to get people to convert to Christianity, he says, instead, we need to get to know each other, listen to each other, and improve our knowledge of the world around us. Is that what the Bible says? Improve your knowledge of the world. Listen to other religions. Get to know other religions. No, the Bible says, can a clean thing come out of an unclean? Not one. The Bible says, go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He says, some save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. That's converting people. Yeah. He's saying, preach unto them that there's no salvation in any other, that they need to be saved through the blood of Jesus. He said, pull them out of the fire, compel them to be saved, the Bible says, but yet Francis says, well, that's just nonsense. We just, need to, we just need to learn about the Hindus. We just need to learn how to, to, to gain what we can from Islam. And we just need to learn from the Jews and, and just get to know each other. Don't try to convert them. No, we ought to try to convert them. And listen, Amen. if we don't try to convert them, it shows that we don't love them. Right. Because we know that the Bible says that he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. But he that believeth not the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God abideth on him. Yeah. If we know that God's wrath is abiding on someone, if we know that hell is their eternal destiny, if we know that the Bible says that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure and unrighteousness, what kind of a person would we be if we wouldn't warn them? The Bible says that we should warn all men in Colossians chapter one. And if we knew that someone were in grave danger, we would warn them. If the house is on fire, you warn them. If they're about to drink poison, you warn them. You don't just stand by and let it happen and say, well, I'm just going to get to know you as you burn in a house fire. I just want to learn more about you as you go sailing off the cliff in your vehicle. That doesn't make any sense, does it? But it does make sense to somebody who just doesn't believe the Bible right. and just doesn't believe that salvation is through Jesus at all. So he, ah, we're all redeemed. Let's just get to know each other. It's false. Listen to this quote from Pope Francis. Each of us has a vision of good and of evil. We have to encourage people to move toward what they think is good. Everyone has his own idea of good and evil and must choose to follow the good and fight the evil as he conceives them. Wow. That would be enough to make the world a better place. 
He's saying we all have our own ideas of good and evil that are all different from one another, and all we have to do is just do what we think is good. Look, this is what Pope Francis said. I'm not making this stuff up. Go fact check this. And if you're going to sit there and say, well, I can't believe you're getting on Catholicism. Here's the thing about Catholicism. You can't be a Catholic without acknowledging Pope Francis as the representative of God on earth. That's what Catholicism is all about. And if I were to take you this afternoon to a Catholic bookstore, we would walk in there and there would just be pictures everywhere of Pope Francis. Pictures everywhere of, of previous popes. Pictures everywhere of Mary and so forth. But the pope would be everywhere. This is part of the, of the religion is you're following this guy. This guy is your pastor. This guy is your leader, according to Catholicism. He says, well, everybody has their own ideas about what's good. And as long as they just do what they think is good, that's enough. What about the absolute right and wrong that God has set forth in the Bible? Now listen to some scriptures from the Bible along these lines of the book of Proverbs. You don't have to turn there. If you would, flip over to 1 Corinthians 5. I'm going to read for you from the book of Proverbs. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Yep. So just following what you think is good, the Bible says the end thereof is the way of death. If you just go with what seems right. No, you got to go with what the Bible says is right. Listen to this, Proverbs 3, 7. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Proverbs 12, 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. Yeah. But he that hearkeneth unto, the, unto counsel is wise. So a fool always thinks that he's right, the Bible says. Francis says, hey, just go with it. Then we would be living a life of foolishness. Yeah. And the Bible says in Proverbs 16, 2, All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes. Yeah. But the Lord weigheth the Spirit. Look, everybody thinks that what they do is right. That's why they're doing it. Yeah. If they didn't think it was right, they wouldn't be doing it. I mean, people like to justify their own actions. And so Pope Francis says, hey, as long as you think it's right, just do it. Just go with it. That's all you need to do. Proverbs 21, 2. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. Yeah. Proverbs 30, verse 12. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. Amen. It says even the filthiest of generations think that they're pure in their own eyes. Right. Isaiah 5, 21, Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. No, we can't trust ourselves to decide what's right and wrong. We go with the word of God to tell us what is right and what is wrong. The Bible says, whoso trusteth in his own heart is a fool. The Bible says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Right. So along those same lines, here's another quote from Pope Francis. If someone's gay, and, he, and I don't use that word, but he does. If someone's gay, and he, he doesn't mean like if they're happy and cheerful and friendly and nice to be around either. Yeah, if they're a sodomite. If someone is gay and he searches for the Lord and has goodwill, who am I to judge? We shouldn't marginalize people for this. They must be integrated into society. Now, let's look at what the Bible says, because he says, who am I to judge? He's like, whoa, who am I to judge somebody who's a homo? Well, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, because this is about fornication, and being a homo is, a, is the worst kind of fornication. You know, it's, it's even a, a worse fornication. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5, 1, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have decided, who am I to judge? Is that what it says? No, he says, I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed. So if someone is in major sin to the tune of fornication, to the tune of sodomy, to the tune of adultery? Should we just say, well, who am I to judge? No, he said, I've judged already. I wasn't even there. Why? Because God's word is absolute on these things. Now, just flip one page to the right, 1 Corinthians 6, in case you have any doubt 
about whether or not it's right for us to judge. And this has become the mantra of the atheists today. The mantra of the left wing today is just this judge not. They take it out of context. They don't get Christ's full teaching. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 2. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world, Pope Francis? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But he's just saying, oh, well, who am I to judge? Well, the Bible says that even the least esteemed person in the church is qualified to judge matters of this life and that we're going to judge angels and the saints are going to judge the world. So this idea of, well, who am I to judge doesn't make any sense. Jesus said in John 7, 24, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Right. So we are to judge, but we're to judge righteous judgment. Here's another quote from him along the same line. He said, a person once asked me in a provocative manner if I approved of homosexuality. I replied with another question. Tell me, when God looks at a gay person, does he endorse the existence of this person with love or reject and condemn this person? We must always consider the person. Now, here's the thing about Pope Francis' statement here. First of all, he says, you know, well, when God looks at them, does he reject or condemn them? First of all, the very term reprobate literally means reject. Yeah. Yeah. And Romans 1, which is all about yeah. this issue, uses that word reprobate. Yeah. So yes, he does reject them. And then he said, well, would he condemn them? Well, what does the Bible say? Flip over to Jude. La second to last book in the New Testament is Jude. While you're turning there, I'll read for you from Leviticus 20:13. If a man also lie with mankind, as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Now, notice it doesn't say they shall surely be integrated into society. <laughs> Which is what he said, right? He says they shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Listen to, you say, well, that's Old Testament. Okay, let's go to the New Testament. Jude, verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, which, by the way, Sodom and Gomorrah is an Old Testament story. Very early in the Bible, Genesis 19. 19th chapter in the whole Bible, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, queer flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Notice he says that story of Sodom and Gomorrah is present tense today an example. Yeah. So thousands of years after Sodom and Gomorrah, Jude is preaching and saying, Sodom and Gomorrah is our example today of those that should afterward live ungodly. He says they are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. Now, is this Francis's attitude? Is he saying, well, these filthy people, but who am I to judge? That's not what he said. He's just like, oh man, we don't want to condemn, we don't want to reject, who am I to judge? I mean, let's integrate them, let's just bring them in. He says, likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion and speak evil of dignities. Flip a few pages to the left in your Bible towards 2 Peter 2. Just a couple pages to the left, 2 Peter chapter 2. The Bible says in verse 6, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly and deliver just lot vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. God describes them as filthy. God is ready to judge them. God is bringing up Sodom and Gomorrah as an example saying, don't think that I have changed on this. I feel the same about it today as I felt about it when I poured fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. That's an example. See, he doesn't have to do that to every San Francisco that's out there. He's just saying, I did it once as an example. Yeah. And it's the eternal fire that they ought to worry about. Because, you know, fire that comes down from the sky and burned up Sodom and Gomorrah, that's temporal. 
But the eternal fire is hell. Yeah. And Francis is way off base with this, but what's he doing? Being popular. This is what people want to hear today. They don't want to hear sodomy condemned. They don't want to hear the homos reviled. They want it to be accepted and loved. I mean, it's a popular message when you say everybody's saved. Everybody's redeemed. Everybody's going to heaven. Let's not judge anyone. Here's another quote from Pope Francis. He said this, A church without women would, would be like the apostolic college without Mary. But listen to this, The Madonna is more important than the apostles. Okay, so according to the Pope, the Madonna, which is the Virgin Mary, right? The Madonna is more important than the apostles. Well, let's see if that matches up with Scripture, because let's face it, one of the major features of Catholicism is the worship of Mary. You don't believe me? Let's get in the car and let's drive less than two miles, and we will enter the city of Guadalupe. Yeah. And when we enter the city of Guadalupe, and, and I know, because I personally have pretty much knocked every single door in Guadalupe. Our church has knocked the doors in Guadalupe about six times. And so since I was a part of all six of those times, knocking every single door in Guadalupe, I've probably personally knocked most of the doors in Guadalupe myself, okay? And I've definitely walked up and down every single street in Guadalupe. Even if I didn't knock every door, I walked up and down every single street. And almost every single house has an idol unto Mary in the front yeah. lawn. They have a little shrine, they have a little altar everywhere imagery of Mary. It's called Mariolatry, you know, idolatry around Mary. They worship Mary. You drive down to Mexico, you see the same thing. Drive even just on the, on the roads, you're just driving down the highway, and out in the middle of nowhere, just a Mary shrine here, Mary shrine there, Mary shrine here, everywhere. It's extremely common. If we walked in again to the Catholic bookstore, there would be just a multitude of pictures of Mary. They pray to Mary. They worship Mary. They have images of Mary. They put a big emphasis on Mary. When people think of Catholicism, they think of Mary. That's one of the biggest things that distinguishes Catholicism from evangelical Christianity or from being Baptist or any other just normal Bible-believing Christian. The thing that distinguishes the Catholic from the Christian is Mary worship. I mean, that's probably the big one. Well, according to the Pope, the Madonna, Mary, is more important than the Apostles. Well, let's think about this for a second. How many times is Mary mentioned in the Bible? If we look up how many times Mary is mentioned by name in the Bible, it's 19 times. 19 times in this book. Okay, let's compare that with some other Bible characters. The Lord is mentioned 8,000 times. David. King David, David and Goliath, okay? 1,139 times. So Mary, 19. David, 1,139. Okay, Jesus is mentioned over 900 times. Mary, 19, okay? Moses is mentioned 848 times. Mary, 19. Aaron, I mean, and Aaron wasn't really the coolest Bible character ever. Aaron himself is mentioned 350 times. Jacob is mentioned 377 times. Abraham is mentioned 250 times. Listen, the Old Testament King Saul. King Saul is mentioned almost 400 times. Mary, 19. Okay? But this is the big emphasis for them. I mean, this is their whole... You know what that tells me? Their religion is not based on this book at all. Even the Quran mentions Mary more than the Bible. The Quran mentions Mary 35 times, or 34 times. I mean, the Bible only mentions Mary 19 times in the whole Bible. Why? Because she's not emphasized. In fact, someone even came up to Jesus, and a woman cried out in the crowd, and she said, Blessed is the womb that bare thee, and blessed are the paps which thou hast sucked. And he said, Yea, rather blessed is he that heareth the word of God and do with it. Amen. You'll be more blessed than Mary, he said, if you just hear the word of God and do it. Yeah. What about when Jesus is preaching in Matthew chapter 12 and his mother and his brethren stand without desiring to meet with them? And he says, who is my mother 
And who are my brethren? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, he said, The same is my brother and sister and mother. Yep. Man, that's exactly but yet they're lifting up Mary as literally a goddess. As literally being someone that they pray to, worship, greatly emphasize, huge emphasis. And yet Caleb is mentioned 36 times. Even Caleb. <laughs> Joshua is mentioned 216 times. Samson is mentioned 39 times. Hezekiah is mentioned 128 times. Mary, 19. <laughs> the Apostle Paul is mentioned over 180 times because remember, the Pope said, hey, the Madonna is more important than the Apostles. Okay, well then why is the Apostle Paul mentioned over 180 times in addition to writing 13 of the 27 books of the, or 14 of the 27 books of the New Testament. If she's more important. Well, what about Peter? Well, he's mentioned 162 times. Mary's mentioned 19 times. Okay, other Marys. You know, there are other Marys in the Bible, like for example, Mary and Martha, Mary Magdalene. The other Marys, because there's about four or five other Marys, they're mentioned 35 times. Other Marys. So most of the time, when Mary's mentioned, it's not even that Mary. It's other Marys that are being mentioned, okay? More than the Madonna, so-called. Okay, you say, well, you know, the Bible just doesn't talk a lot about women. Okay, well, Sarah is mentioned 59 times. There's a woman in the Bible who's mentioned more than three times as many times as the Virgin Mary. What about Esther? Mentioned 56 times. Look, even Jezebel is mentioned 22 times. Okay. <laughs> And King Saul's daughter, King Saul's daughter, Michal, which virtually no one, unless they've read the whole Bible or been in church their whole life, has ever even heard of. King Saul's daughter, Michal, is mentioned 18 times. One more mention and she would have tied the Virgin Mary. <clears throat> and so it's clear that the Bible does not put this huge emphasis on Mary. It, it, it says, how can you ignore this? And that even amongst some of the mentions of Mary, some of them are Jesus telling people, whoa, you're putting her on too high of a pedestal. You know, what about when Jesus looked at Mary and said, woman, what have I to do with thee? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, but to sit there and put her as the mother of God, it's false yeah. Yeah. because of the fact that Jesus Christ existed before his incarnation, before he became flesh. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not, made anything, was not anything made that was made. And it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelled among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Uh, Hebrews 7 says of Jesus, Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. So there are two aspects to the Lord Jesus Christ. He was human, but he was also God in the flesh. Okay. Well, here's the thing. Mary was only his mother, humanly speaking, just of the flesh. That's why even when they called Jesus the son of David, because he was of David according to the flesh, he even said, well, if David calls him Lord, how is he then his son? Right. Because what he's showing there is that, wait a minute, I'm God in the flesh, so I'm above David, I'm above Abraham, I'm above Mary, okay? That's why Mary called the Lord her Savior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She needed a Savior, she wasn't perfect. She was an, a great woman, but she does not deserve to be worshipped as a goddess or, or anything else. But is it from the Bible? No, the Bible barely even mentions her. Very, very minor character. We can list many, many other people, scores of other characters that are mentioned more times, way more times, hundreds more times. Okay, look if you would at Jeremiah chapter 7. You say, where is this, where is this Mary worship coming from? Well, I'll tell you where it comes from. It comes from Eastern false religion. Eastern false religion. You see, if we were to go to India, they have been worshiping the great mother, the great goddess, for 
thousands of years, even thousands of years before Jesus Christ. You know, when they're not worshiping the golden calf and when they're not worshiping Satan, when they're not worshiping serpents and, you know, uh, all their different false gods of Hinduism, you know, in southern India, they have been worshiping the great mother. In fact, they have even performed human sacrifices under this false female deity. This is something that is part of Eastern religion going back thousands of years in India. This is where it comes from. It comes from the devil. And the Bible talks about it because of the fact that in Jeremiah, some of the children of Israel had gotten mixed up in some of these false religions from the East. Now, the thing about this is that in this passage, she's referred to as the queen of heaven that they're worshiping. And even today, Catholics will refer to Mary as the queen of heaven, literally. And in fact, I even saw a cemetery in Phoenix that said queen of heaven cemetery. And I've seen another Queen of Heaven Catholic Church yep. naming the church after it. Look at Jeremiah chapter 7. It says in verse 18, The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. Now, does this sound familiar? You're basically making a cake and a drink, and worshiping the queen of heaven? See, there's nothing new under the sun. Go to Jeremiah 44. And, you know, if you were here a few months ago, you remember the sermon I did a few months ago where I showed that Buddhism and Catholicism have the same false teachings, and that Catholicism, basically all the weird stuff that's in Catholicism, and you wonder where it came from, it came from Buddhism, because Buddhism is from 500 B.C., approximately. So they, that's where they get the, the nuns, the monks. Did you ever wonder why there's the Buddhist monks and the Catholic monks? And the Buddhist nuns and the Catholic nuns and the Buddhist monastery and the Catholic monastery and the Buddhists have, and I'm not going to re-preach that sermon, but I went through and showed all the things that they've just imported from Eastern false religion. But look what the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 44, verse 15. Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods, and all the women that stood by a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt, in Pathros, answered Jeremiah, saying, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee, but we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth. Now, that reminds me of what Francis said, right? Just do what you think is right. Do what you think is good. To burn incense unto the queen of heaven. Now, that's another thing that the Catholics like to do, don't they? Burn incense unto the queen of heaven. Yeah. And to pour out drink offerings unto her, as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings, and our princes in the cities of Judah, and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then had we plenty of victuals and were well, and saw no evil. But since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things, and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her? Did we make her cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? So they're saying the men were doing it too. And this, I don't understand why this wouldn't go against the grain for men to bow down and worship a woman. You say, oh, you're so misogynistic. Oh, you chauvinist, sexist pig. But here's the thing though. You know, we as men are wired by God not to be ruled over by women. Right. That's why the Bible says the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Okay, we as men have a desire to lead a woman and not to be led by a woman. And women naturally have a desire to follow their husband, not to rule over their husband. Now, our society has tried to engineer that differently through the brainwashing campaigns and school and TV and media to try to get women to think that they really want to be powerful and bossy. But actually, it makes women miserable to be in that role that they don't belong in. And they're much happier when they get in their proper role, you know, with a strong man leading them. And men are, are not naturally inclined to want to be uh, in submission unto a woman. Okay, so it's just kind of strange, a whole religion that's based upon worshiping a woman. 
it goes against the grain for a man who understands the man's role in the family, the man's, I mean, understands that in a home, dad's the boss, that in a marriage, the husband is the boss, but to have this attitude where we're worshiping a woman in heaven and that she's going to somehow, you know, tell Jesus how things are going to be and we go to her to intercede and, and she intercedes with us to Jesus and she's even known as the mediatrix basically a feminine version of the mediator. And the Bible says there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And the priest is not a mediator. The Pope is not a mediator. Mary is not a mediator. No, there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. That is the only mediator. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. The Bible says that we boldly come before the throne of grace and find mercy and obtain help in time of need through our high priest, Jesus Christ, not through the confessional booth, not through, you know, all these prayers to saints and prayers to Mary and all these different people. It's false. So here's the good news, though, okay? In conclusion, those are all the quotes that I have from Pope Francis. You can see that he's a liar. You can see that he's a false prophet. He's wrong on salvation. He's wrong on morality. You know, he's wrong on so many things. And yet, people are looking to him today as being a representative of God on this earth. People today are crying. They're trying to literally touch the hem of his garment. They're hoping that the shadow of him might pass over them. They want to just touch that foot or kiss that big toe and never wash that mouth again. And you know what? People think it's a joke. But literally, kissing the Pope's big toe is a Catholic tradition. Yeah. For hundreds, of, and, and basically, it used to be that they would come and kiss his hand, which is already, you know, humiliating yourself when you bow down and kiss a man's hand. But then they changed it to kissing his foot. I forget which Pope it changed, but there's a certain historical Pope that said, you know what, from now on, you're going to kiss my foot. And they kiss his toe. And then there's even a statue where they've kissed the toe so much that the toe is worn away from all the mouths wearing away. I'm, this is not a joke. This is real. You know, if I ever had a chance to kiss the Pope's big toe, I'd bite it off. No, I'm just but anyway, here's the conclusion, though. Here's the good news, all right? The good news is that Catholics are some of the easiest people to get saved. You know, the good, you say, oh man, you hate Catholics, you're anti-Catholic. I don't hate Catholics at all. You know what, if I hated Catholics, I would just tell them, hey, you're all saved. <laughs> you, guys are, you guys are just like, you're going to heaven. That would be hate, because then it would just be like, see ya, as they go off into hell. No, the truth is that Catholics are some of the easiest people to get saved. You know, when I go out soul winning, and I get into a Catholic area, that's usually an area where you're going to get people saved. Why? Because most people are Catholics only out of ignorance. They're born into it, they're sprinkled into it as a baby, and they just don't know any better. It's not even that they're just choosing to follow a lie, it's that they're just raised with it, they don't know any better, and usually if you can show a Catholic the gospel from the Bible, they're very likely to be saved. In fact, if I were to choose between uh, talking to a Jew, a Muslim, a Catholic, a Pentecostal, or you know, a Mormon, a Jehovah's Witness, you know, an atheist, a Buddhist, a, 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 a Hindu, the one that would probably be the most likely to get saved is the Catholic. Baptist churches today across America are filled with ex-Catholics. Filled with them. In fact, right now, let me ask, who here used to be Catholic? Put up your hand. Look around the building. This is how many people used to be Catholic. So the great news is that the one billion Catholics of this world are white unto harvest. They're ready to be saved. We need to get out there and knock doors and say, well, why'd you knock the doors in Guadalupe five, six times? That's why. Because it's a receptive area. Because it's an area where you're... Now, of course, you're going to run into the rare dyed-in-the-wool Catholic who actually knows what they believe and is really strong on the doctrines of the church and so forth. But the vast majority of Catholics, you know it and I know it, they show up to church about three times a year just when somebody's getting baptized or getting married or something like that. And they're not really that into it, and they're usually pretty open to hearing what the Bible says 
about the gospel. And if you do a thorough job and show them the scriptures and make sure that they know that it's by faith and not works and make sure that they know, hey, this is what, and what I do is first I go through the whole plan of salvation with them. I don't just come out right away and say, well, you know, Francis, and start going after him. You know, because then they're just going to shut the door. What I usually do is I start out by just going through the whole plan of salvation like I normally would. Amen. Just ask them if they know for sure they're going to heaven. Can I show you? And I go through the whole thing and I show them it's by faith, that it's not by works. I show them that it's eternal. And then when I get down to the very end, though, because sometimes Catholics could have a tendency to just politely listen to you. And then they'll just they'll just repeat a prayer with you because they're so used to chanting stuff. But that doesn't mean that they're saved. Because it's our faith that saves us, not just saying words that we don't mean. So therefore, I, I always get to the end after I give them the gospel and I say this. I say, well, listen, you said you mentioned you were Catholic. The Catholic Church teaches something different than what I've been showing you for the past 10 minutes. They actually teach that you do have to do works, that you have to perform the sacraments, go to church, do good deeds in order to get to heaven. Whereas the Bible is saying that it's just all by our faith in Jesus. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, which one do you believe? That way I'm bringing them to a point where they have to make a decision. Not just, well, let me just tag this on to the other thousands of prayers I've prayed. But they actually understand, no, no, no. I'm going to stop believing it the wrong way and I'm going to start believing it the right way. And I'm going to ask Jesus to be my savior, putting all my faith in him, not ask him to be my savior, but really I'm doing the work. And I'm doing it through the church and I'm doing it through Mary and everything else. And usually when I get to that point, if I ask that question, which one do you believe? You'll get one of two answers. You'll get the people that say, well, I believe what the Bible says, that it's all by faith. You know, then that person has got it. Then you pray with them and they call upon the name of the Lord and it's a done deal. But a lot of times I'll get to that point, I'll ask that question and they'll say, well, you know, I, I still believe what the Catholic Church teaches. And then at that point, it's just, all right, well, you know, think about what I showed you. Have a good day. Move on. They, you know, they, they're not ready to accept the truth. They've heard it. They've understood it. But they're just going to stick with tradition. They're going to stick with what they've been handed down. Now, the big word that comes to mind with Catholicism is tradition. And Catholics that are really serious Catholics, which I said are, are, are kind of rare, really. But when you run into these really serious Catholics that really are versed in it, they'll tell you that you don't have the right to interpret the Bible on your own. The church needs to interpret it for you and so forth. Well, one time I was on this airplane and I was talking to a guy that was one of these really serious Catholics. And we spent hours talking because we're on the plane. We're sitting by each other. And there's nothing else to do. Captive audience, you know. So we spent hours talking. And this guy was a really serious Catholic, and he's telling me the church is what interprets it for you. You can't interpret it on your own and this and that. But he was part of a branch of Catholicism that was a more fundamentalist branch. So basically, they accept everything up until Vatican II. Now, Vatican II was a major overhaul of the Catholic Church that took place in the 1960s. Okay, And in Vatican II, that's when they stopped doing the services in Latin and started actually doing them in language that people spoke. And they also said, you know, hey, the Jews aren't responsible for the death of Jesus and, and, you know, stuff like that. They just changed some of their doctrine and they changed some of their teachings. And they basically just got a lot more liberal and a lot more modernistic in the 60s at this thing called Vatican II. And this guy said, well, we believe everything up through Vatican II. But I, but I looked at the guy and said, wait a minute, you just told me that you can't interpret the Bible on your own, but that the church is supposed to do it for you. So what get, why are you accepting the first 20 of these ecumenical councils and then you're going to reject number 21, Vatican II? And he's just like, well, you know. Uh, you know. It's like, wait, wait a minute. If you're just going to blindly follow the church as your final authority, then you have to accept Vatican II. Yeah. And when they say, hey, it's okay to be a homo, you have to accept that too. Because whatever, and if they, I mean, if they, look, if whatever they tell you, because you're just like, woo, 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 you know, I can't interpret the Bible on my own, must follow Roman church. If you're going to be that way, then you have to accept everything that he's, every stupid thing that they say. And who knows what, because listen, they haven't always believed the way they believe now. You know, they've changed things. You know, there was a certain time when the infant baptism 
was introduced, when the sprinkling was introduced. There was a certain time when the worship of Mary was introduced. Mary's sinless life was introduced. The ascension of Mary to heaven. I mean, that's not in the Bible, but they teach that Mary ascended into heaven like Jesus. She never died. But these doctrines were rolled out later. So Catholicism is a religion where you just believe what the church tells you. Let me tell you something. This church, Faithful Word Baptist Church, is not a church where you're expected to believe what the church tells you. You are expected to believe what the Bible tells you. Amen. And I'll say it right now. If I get up and preach something that's not biblical, you have every right to walk away and say, I don't agree with Pastor Anderson on that because that's not what the Bible says. Okay, because this is the, I'm not the final authority. I'm just up here preaching, expounding, and then it's your job to basically decide whether what I'm preaching is true. And if what I'm preaching is not true, then you can go somewhere else and find someone that's preaching the truth. And if I am preaching the truth, then you come and, and be a part of the church and say, yeah, this is someone that I want to follow because he's preaching the truth according to the Bible. Like Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Whereas the Catholic Church is saying that the church is the authority, Bible is lower on the list because you can't, because you're just, you're not reading it right. You're interpreting. Whereas the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. Yep. We don't need a mediator to teach us the Bible or else we could just never figure it out on our own. So the good news is that Catholics are easy to win to the Lord. And if we love our Catholic co-worker or Catholic neighbor or, you know, Catholic acquaintances, then we need to give them the gospel. We need to show them the truth and, and preach the truth in love and show them how to be saved and not get this idea that Catholics are saved. Because a lot of Baptists even today will think, oh, Catholics are saved. They're not saved because they believe that salvation by works. And, and you say, well, are you saying all the Catholics, a billion Catholics are wrong? Yes, I'm saying that broad is the way that leads to destruction. Amen. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that le which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. But we need to go out and preach the truth, and we need to expose this, this Francis for the fraud that he is. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, and thank you that it is to everyone that believeth, Lord. And Lord, we know that for those who do not believe in Jesus, there is absolutely no hope. The Bible says that they are without hope. They have no hope and they are without God in the world. But Lord, help us to preach the glorious gospel of Christ unto them, that they might be saved. And please help this, this fraud, Pope Francis, to be exposed for the lying false prophet that he is and that people would stop following him and worshiping him and realize that he is a deceiver and a devil. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.